sort of by way of introductions, uh, my name is Osa Gaius. Uh, and, and today we'll be talking about why Elixir matters, or put differently, how to make Elixir matter. Uh, I plan to provide you with more generally a genealogy of functional programming. Uh, as, as was mentioned, I work at MailChimp in Atlanta. MailChimp is the world's leading marketing automation platform for small businesses. In addition, I also help organize the Atlanta Elixir meetup, uh, and I've done so for almost two years now. Uh, this talk will proceed as follows. Um, by way of introduction, you know, we'll sort of talk about what I mean by genealogy. Uh, then we'll explore the history of functional programming before, of course, discussing why Elixir in particular matters. Uh, we'll then wrap up with some thoughts on how we can move forward. So a few months ago, a young man walked up to me after the Elixir meetup, which we have once a month, and he asked me a simple question. Uh, his question was, why should I learn Elixir? As I began to talk through the features of the language, uh, I paused and I realized at that point that I knew nothing about this guy who I was talking to. So I stopped, I got his name, and I began to ask more questions about him. And over the next few minutes, I realized that his question was a bit more nuanced. I learned that he had recently started attending a full-time boot camp for programming at a place called General Assembly while working a regular job at nights. And so he rephrased his question to me. He said, why does functional programming matter? You see, he was learning Node.js, Ruby on Rails, React.js, AngularJS, and a slew of other sort of concepts in just 12 weeks. He was sleeping very little. And on the nights when he wasn't working his regular job, he was attending meetups like mine to learn more about programming. As I looked in his eyes, I realized his question was very, very nuanced. His question really was, why should I spend the little amount of time that I have left in my day to learn about this functional programming thing? And so I wanted to admonish him uh, to understand how concurrency affects modern distributed web systems. I wanted to tell him to run home and watch every rich hickey video he could find because those videos changed my life. I also wanted to tell him that you know, recursion was, was you know, in inherently beautiful and, and was its own reward. However, I realized at that point that th this guy was hoping, praying just to get a job when he graduated boot camp in the next few weeks as a junior developer at some local shop. More importantly, I realized that none of my answers to him about why functional programming mattered were, were non-theoretical. I fumbled through like an introduction to distributed systems and I told him to focus on learning Rails because most local companies in Atlanta were going to give him a job doing Rails. I went home that night exhausted and kind of sad about my, my failure to defend my language of choice and more importantly to defend functional programming. As I reflected, myself tired, I realized that part of it was that I had a hard time explaining functional programming because I had forgotten why I fell in love with it because I'd spent the last few years working professionally using functional programming techniques, from writing React uh, in a functional style on the front end, to building back end systems in Clojure, and then eventually landing in the world of Elixir. I've had the privilege of being enamored by and doing functional programming for most of my career. For that reason, I struggled to find a sort of coherent, non-circular explanation for why functional programming mattered, especially to someone who had no experience programming. You see, a sizable portion of the folks who come to my meet every month uh, currently are attending boot camps. And, and the most of them have a small amount of time to do two things. They have to, one, learn how to write software, and at the same time, they have to find a job. They attend meetups to learn about Elixir because they're looking to learn something that will give them an edge as they go out and look for jobs. So a lecture on some sort of functional programming concepts like monads for them is quite useless because for them, they are trying to gain an understanding. And more importantly, they have no mental models or biases around programming. And so for them, it's purely about learning. So just as I failed to defend Elixir that night, I feel that a fundamental presupposition of this talk is that functional programming itself has failed, which is to say that we, as a functional programming community, have failed. Failure, I suppose, it stings, it hurts. Uh, by its very definition and declaration, at a functional programming conference, it's a bit odd to say that functional programming has failed, right? However, when we look at the top 15 programming languages today, uh, you know, starting with Java on the top in blue uh, and looking also at C, uh, 
uh, functional programming does not sort of appear on, on an index like this, right? This in particular is the Tybee index. Functional programming languages consistently do not even rank. We observe that even languages like Python and Java and even Ruby continue to flourish, as you can see in the graph here. Even more alarmingly, if we define success as the availability of jobs, which I think is a good measure of success, we come to the conclusion that functional languages have failed. As you can see here, in the last two years, functional languages do not offer the same number of jobs as languages that we often sort of tried, like Perl or PHP. So how can we in good conscience, how can I in good conscience really tell my boot camp students who come to these meetups that they should learn functional programming, that they should learn Elixir? Now, I'm aware, and, and I've, I've been told this uh, in the past, that we could define success uh, not by number of jobs or by the popularity of the language, but rather by uh, the new research ground that's broken or the new concepts that a language introduces. However, I think that that, that sort of thinking is, is, is somewhat dubious uh, because it avoids the hard work of actually coming to terms with why functional languages continue to lag behind. In fact, the prevailing argument of this talk rests on the fact and the claim that functional programming and we as a community continue to fail precisely because of our incapacity to be attuned to the fact that in the real world it is not the functional concepts that matter but the jobs that people can acquire. Our capacity to reverse the tide then will be determined by how we can learn from and reverse the mistakes made by the functional programming community that came before us. More to the point, in order for Elixir, and, and, and by extension, of course, Erlang, to develop a large and diverse community, it must assume that functional programming has failed so that we can take a different approach. So the, the, the title of this talk has the word genealogy in it. So let's talk a bit about genealogy uh, and, and more specifically the history of functional programming. Uh, most commentaries on functional programming languages or language adoption more generally fail to account for power uh, or as a constituent element when we're discussing these things. In other words, these commentaries assume that programming languages are chosen in a vacuum, right? There's a tendency to focus on language features like dynamic typing or static typing as the reason why certain languages gain popularity and others do not. Moreover, in the case of commentaries on functional programming, we fail to deeply discuss why Erlang or Lisp fail to take hold, and instead we get muddled in discussions about our language features or the features we care about, like currying or pattern matching. In an even worse turn of events, we as a community get sidetracked into discussions where we simply perhaps malign other languages, like Java or Ruby, for what they lack. What these diatribes miss is a proper analysis of the past, a failure, and I argue then that genealogy is a methodology through which we can have better discussions. Genealogy takes on two forms. Uh, first and foremost, we can think of it as an account of the ancestry and descent of a person, a family, or perhaps a group. Uh, genealogy allows us to understand a group of individuals or a species that have a common origin. It allows us to understand, for instance, the story of you, right? So when I speak of your genealogy, what we're speaking of is how you came to be. So your grandparents to your parents, so on and so forth. Uh, secondarily, genealogy uh, can be traced back to this man, uh, Michel Foucault, the French philosopher. Uh, and his sort of primary ideology was that genealogy can be thought of as a development of the ideas of truth through history. For Foucault, understanding why one thing takes precedence over another requires us to understand power in a sort of social political sense. For instance, take this very simple question. Why did the JVM, or the Java Virtual Machine, become more popular than the Erlang VM? In today's commentary, the messy details of power and knowledge are left unanswered. In other words, we don't actually get to the heart of the question, but we instead begin to talk about why the Erlang VM is better than the JVM, right? But that isn't that useful a discussion in the sense that it doesn't help us understand why one becomes more popular than the other. More alarmingly, the question often sort of devolves into debates over which syntax is better, whether or not just-in-time compilation is indeed awesome or not. But from a genealogical perspective, we must delve into the gray, into the politics of industry adoption, into the undocumented conversations and code bases. So here, I will treat functional programming as a family of languages, 
with different species. And I think this will help us deconstruct accepted precepts about the development and adoption of functional programming. So in regards to history, uh, you know, the early period of functional programming begins uh, in the early 1930s and lasts until the late, late uh, 1960s. I call this period the early work, right? Uh, and, and it begins, you know, and we'll look at it, you know, in the 1930s, but we'll also go all the way up to the, the sort of the 2000s and look a bit more into the future. But if you look at the 1930s in, the, in this sort of early work period, Lambda Calculus emerges uh, based on Alonzo Church's work. It's a system of mathematical logic for describing computation based on functions using a, a sort of variable binding as well as substitution. It's a model of computation that can be used to build a Turing machine and it becomes the common ancestor for all functional programming languages today. In 1958, uh, sort of, you know, Lisp emerges. It sort of takes Lambda Calculus, which is often considered very difficult and very challenging, uh, in other words, not for the weak, and it attempts to sort of systematize it and make it more uh, digestible. And so we see Lisp emerge in 1958, and, and it's important to note that Lisp was not truly based on the Lambda Calculus, but rather it simply used the word Lambda to denote functions. It was instead based on first order recursion equations with dynamic binding and S expressions. Moreover, uh, and more importantly though, it is considered the first practical application of functional programming to language design. To borrow from C.K. Ewan's phrasing, Lisp is basically lambda calculus with a user-friendly appearance or syntactic sugar. So moving forward a bit, I think we then enter this period that I'm characterizing as the pre-Renaissance, or uh, what I refer to as making functional programming practical. And it starts with Scheme's emergence in 1970 and marks the beginning of this period. Uh, while still academic and research focused, we see an overall dedication in functional programming communities to taking the early ideas from Lisp and Lambda Calculus and making them more useful for programming work. Uh, and this sort of period that we'll talk about, the pre-Renaissance, lasts until the early 2000. Scheme is one of the main dialects of Lisp, uh, or to borrow from David Turner, the author of Sassel, it is not until Scheme that the versions of Lisp with static binding appear. In other words, it is not until Scheme that uh, Lisp truly becomes based on Lambda Calculus. Put simply, Lisp, uh, you know, sort of emerges and then Scheme takes Lisp and then makes it adhere more to Lambda Calculus. More interestingly, Lisp uh, sort of at this point becomes sort of very dominated by Scheme, and then Scheme would then lead to development of other sort of variations of Lisp, like Common Lisp. In 1973, ML continues the process of building upon Lisp by adding static typing. It also introduces the novel concept of pattern matching for function arguments. Pattern matching would thereafter become a sort of de facto standard in most functional languages. In 1986, Erlang emerges. Uh, as you may know, it starts at Ericsson as an R&D project to create a language to build better, lang to build better telephone systems, or rather it's a, a, an attempt to build a better language for building telephony systems. However, it's also interesting to remember that during the early sort of days of Erlang, uh, the language itself was mostly made uh, sort of by attempts to modify small talk and, and attempts to modify prologue so that we could do concurrent programming work. And so Erlang is notable because it emerges for the first time in the history of functional programming, uh, this core ideas around functional idioms with a robust concurrent programming model. And this innovation, this melding of concurrent programming as well as functional programming will sort of permeate the rest of functional programming for its history. And will also differentiate Erlang. Miranda, a descendant of the ML language, emerges in 1988 and popularizes ideas around laziness within the function of programming community. Haskell closes out the century and closes out this period in 1997. Uh, it borrows heavily from Miranda, especially this, these ideas around lazy evaluation uh, that Miranda introduced. However, it also introduces static typing. And, and we'll then see static typing or sort of type safety as a sort of important element of other functional programming languages moving forward. The next period we'll talk about is what I call the Renaissance period. Uh, it starts with Scala. Uh, in, in the early 2000s. However, following the late 1990s, we see a resurgence in the interest in functional programming. And I call this period of renaissance because it, it's sort of marked by attempts to make functional programming useful outside the context of research, right? So it goes from primarily R&D projects to 
primarily projects for doing industry work. We see the development of languages being led not by university researchers or industry labs, but by industry practitioners. We see people building languages to solve real problems that they have, particularly by compiling to other languages, other virtual machines, or to other frameworks. As I mentioned, it begins in 2004 with Scala, a functional programming language that runs on the Java virtual machine. Although functional, it borrows extremely uh, from sort of Java's object-oriented approach, but it also borrows from Scheme, ML, and Haskell. So you can think of it then as sort of a mashup of both the object-oriented world that it comes from, but also uh, attempts to sort of borrow from the functional world. We then see F-sharp, a direct descendant of ML, uh, emerge in 2005 that's built upon the Microsoft.NET platform, which can be thought of as very similar to the JVM in that sense. In 2007, Clojure emerges as another functional programming language on the JVM. It, le it leverages the power of the JVM, but unlike Scala, uh, it retains no object-oriented features. It instead adopts Common Lisp uh, with, the, you know, with regards to its dialect as well as its syntax, but also its overall programming model. In 2009, Akka emerges. Although not a functional language, Akka is important in the history of functional programming precisely because it symbolizes the renewed interest in that intersection of functional and concurrent programming that Erlang first explored. This is an area that Erlang opened and has become more important as web services continues to grow. We can think of projects like Microsoft Orleans or even LASP as sort of attempts to continue to explore this intersection. In 2010, Rust arrives, again, you know, borrowing heavily from Haskell's approach to type safety or typing more generally, with an emphasis on concurrency. In 2011, Elixir, the language uh, that I'll focus on here, emerges, and it's an outgrowth of Jose Valim's attempts to build a language that addresses the concurrency limitations within Ruby. It's built on, and of course, compiles to Erlang. In 2012, uh, we see the rise of Elm, another sort of part of the ML family of languages. It compiles to JavaScript, though, and emphasizes strong typing. It is early evidence of the desire for functional programming on the front end, a trend that continues with languages or frameworks like React, Redux, and of course, ClojureScript. Although Elm ends the period we're looking at, this sort of Renaissance period, uh, we'll rewind a bit and focus more specifically on Elixir, which emerges in 2011, and a bit farther back on Erlang, which emerges in 1986. So with that in mind, let's answer the question then of why Elixir matters. But in order for us to answer this question, we have to sort of answer the question why Erlang matters. And I think this quote from, his, uh, from Joe Armstrong is quite apropos. Uh, this com comes from his sort of meditation uh, at, 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 the, at, the, at the juncture of 2007 where he's attempting to explain the history of Erlang to folks. And he says, at the rise in popularity of the internet and the need for non-interrupted availability of services has extended the class of problems that Erlang can solve. So for one, it is true today that the industry is focused on building resilient systems that solve particular business problems. The question perhaps then is why are we not seeing a, a sort of a resurgence or a rapid rise in the popularity of Erlang, right? Uh, outside, of course, you know, the, the, the conferences we all attend. Again, if we revisit that graph from earlier, why do we not see Erlang in that list? And more importantly, why do we not see Elixir in that list? And I believe there's sort of three reasons uh, or three axes to which we can begin to discuss this. I think the first is syntax, right? I think you know, it's often sort of this diatribe that, you know, the syntax of Erlang is hard to understand or it's difficult. And I think that that is, you know, not really that interesting as an argument. I think what is more interesting is to say that Erlang misses an opportunity in terms of the way in which the language is designed does not look like other languages, right? It's distinct for a reason. It is distinct from languages like Java or C Sharp. And for that reason has sort of become less popular over time, precisely because people cannot easily adapt to the language, right? If you look at Ruby and languages like that, they sort of share uh, a sort of common approach to programming in terms of syntax that Erlang does not share, right? And I think for that reason, Erlang missed certain opportunities over the course of its history to adopt or increase its own adoption precisely because its syntax was radically different. Now, just as Lisp is syntactic sugar on Lambda Calculus, to borrow again from C.K. Hewan, we can then say that Elixir and by extension Phoenix are web-focused sugaring on Erlang, right? 
Although Elixir is a language on its own, I think a crowning reason for its value and its ability to take and you know, become more popular is because it represents Erlang to a new generation. And I think this is, this is sort of a, a crowning achievement of the Elixir community, is that what they've done is taken a language with sort of very deep roots and sort of a deep historical approach to programming and have been able to represent it to people in a way that looks familiar to them, in a way that looks very much like Ruby. <laughs> The second sort of axis I think that's interesting is the web. Uh, the reality is we, and we here being the Erlang community, which by extension is of course the Elixir community, we missed an opportunity in the context of Erlang to help shape the web. Uh, in the case of Erlang, although technologies like RabbitMQ and eJabberD, which are core parts of the web, are built upon Erlang, the language itself never took hold as a general purpose web server programming language, right? It is that in terms of its ability, it can do that. However, it never became popular in the same way as Java, etc. If we trace its development, we can see that Java, JavaScript, and Ruby, uh, and Rails all emerge after Erlang, but Erlang still remains sort of a niche language that never reaches the same popularity. We can sort of look at this historically, right? We see Erlang emerge in 1986. In the early 90s, we see Java emerge and sort of take hold as you know, the key way to build things like applets, but also just as the primary way to build web uh, servers. We then see JavaScript emerge as sort of the only uh, you know, sane way to build things with a modern browser. And then finally, we see Ruby and then Rails emerge. And, and what's sort of striking here is that in all this sort of time, in, you know, these, these two, three decades after the emergence of Erlang, we see these new languages take hold of how people begin to build things for the web, such that Erlang is not synonymous with building things for the web, whereas something like Java or JavaScript is synonymous with building things for the internet. And I think as the internet continues to rise, if we go back to sort of Joe's claim, that it's very important to think about why it is that Erlang did not surpass or did not sort of uh, overtake Java. And I think a primary component of this is that the Erlang community simply did not make that a focus, right? We, uh, the Erlang community was not interested in becoming the general purpose language for building things for the web, whereas the Java, the Rails, as well as the JavaScript community, that was their only interest. So if we then think about Elixir uh, by, by sort of definition, Elixir, by contrast, was built from the beginning with the web in mind due to Jose's background uh, in the Rails core team. He aimed, to, he aimed to solve a problem that he had in the same way as other sort of participants in this renaissance period did. The development of Phoenix and the emphasis on, on, on sort of Rails-like simplicity with regards to web development is, characteristic, is sort of very, very different from what we saw in the early 90s as well as the early 2000s in the case of Erlang. And I think that's a sort of unique opportunity for us. The sort of third axis that I think is interesting is evangelism. So if we look at Java, uh, JavaScript, Rails, and even a modern language like Go, for instance, we see an emphasis by companies and the steward and organizations on promoting the languages, right? The reality is that Ericsson did not emphasize this, at least not to the extent, of course, that Sun Microsystems and Oracle did with regards to their languages, in the case of Java, that is. In the case of JavaScript, we see that Netscape and Mozilla, historically, were very aggressive in promoting and ensuring the, the rise as well as the use of the language. You think of things like standardizing uh, JavaScript across all modern web browsers, right? That's an effort being made by Netscape, by Mozilla, et cetera, to make sure that the languages that they were developing would become the de facto standards. Uh, it's also somewhat ironic to note that JavaScript was originally written as a sort of functional language, a mashup of scheme uh, that eventually sort of devolved, or, you know, uh, we can say devolved, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, that's a bit controversial, uh, that eventually slipped into the world of object-oriented programming by adopting ideas from Java as well as a language like self. But if we revisit Joe's quote from earlier, uh, I, th I, think, I think it's more accurate to say, and, and perhaps this is also controversial, that it is Elixir that extends the class of problems that Erlang can solve. Right? It is not Erlang by itself, precisely because Erlang missed some of these opportunities. But I think with the rise of Elixir, Erlang has an opportunity in the age of internet services to address certain kinds of problems and to approach certain kinds of developers and companies that wouldn't by default choose Elixir, or choose Erlang, that is. But the question then is how do we, right, if we are the Erlang community, if we are the Elixir community, how do we ensure that this actually happens, right? Sort of Joe's quote here is a sort of aspirational thing, right? Like we have the potential to do this in this generation, to, to see Erlang and Elixir rise to the, the sort of top 
tier programming languages? How do we ensure that this actually matters? How do we ensure that this occurs in the next decade? So with that in mind, let's, let's turn to, to some kind of further points on how we can move forward. So in a sort of very long historical study on, on programming languages, Meyerovich and Rabkin come up with this sort of final assumption uh, or, or this final thesis. And their thesis is that unpopular languages are by definition niche languages. And the corollary is also true, right? That niche languages are by their definition, of course, unpopular languages. And I think this is quite interesting when thinking about Erlang and particularly Elixir, is that Erlang in many ways can be thought of as a niche language for solving particular kinds of problems. You think of high concurrency messaging, queuing problems, like these are things that Erlang is particularly good at, right? So for that reason, it can be thought of as a niche language. By definition, Elixir sort of can suffer from the same problematics because it is a language built upon Erlang. But how do we solve this? How do we approach this reality that by making ourselves a niche language, we by definition make ourselves an unpopular language? I think there are a couple of approaches. I think the first sort of thing to think about is breadth versus depth, right? Like how do we, how do we build a language? How do we build a language ecosystem? How do we build a community? And I think when thinking about breadth versus depth, there's sort of, sort of this core nexus, right? Do we continue to evolve the language and go deeper into the world of functional and concurrent programming? Or do we actually choose to widen uh, the approach that we take to how we think about building a language? I think libraries here are sort of a, a key way to think about this, right? If we're building libraries to solve problems, are we building libraries that are you know, significantly better at particular domains or particular kinds of problems? Or are we building a more diverse set of libraries that can solve different kinds of business problems? I think if you look at the sort of Rails community, I think this is one area where they completely sort of shined unlike most other language communities. And in the sense that gems can be thought of as very diverse set of tools to solve a wide array of problems. So if you look at a gem, for instance, it might not be the best sort of piece of computer science work. However, there are so many gems such that for every single problem you have, there is a gem to solve that. We can go back and forth on whether or not simplicity uh, versus ease is sort of uh, you know, a trade-off we want to make. However, the reality is that in order for languages to become popular, uh, they have to sort of avoid niche status by sort of widening the gamut of problems that they are able to solve. And languages that do not do this, by definition, become niche languages. The second thing to think about is the domains uh, through which languages uh, sort of can be spread, right? So you think of very sort of simple case, you know, you're building a sort of messaging system. It does make sense to reach for something uh, like Erlang. However, if you think of something like, let's say you're building uh, a, a simple website, right? Or you're building a, an embedded system. In those cases, it's particularly hard to say that you should reach for Erlang precisely because those domains are not ones that we have spent time and invested in. I think Elixir has a unique opportunity here precisely because Elixir has approached these domains like the web, for instance, with an emphasis on making sure that those sort of domains are well served, but also domains like embedded systems are being approached in a very deliberate way uh, by the Elixir community. I think this is work that we as the Erlang as well as the Elixir community can continue to do in the sense that let's find domains or business problems that are common, that are reoccurring, that people are attempting to solve, and let's go after those domains. Let's build tools to solve problems in those domains because that is precisely how you convince people to use a language and is also how as a developer, I can convince my boss to let me use a particular kind of language. Now, uh, the second sort of area that I think is a bit harder than sort of language development in, in its sort of basic sense is evangelism, right? I think this is an often underthought area that when we look at the history of functional programming and programming more generally, I think evangelism is precisely where languages win and other languages lose. So if we look first, I think there's sort of this big work to be done around marketing. Uh, I think, you know, Codebeam as an organization, uh, as well as Erlang Solutions, has done a great job of helping to market Erlang and by extension Elixir as a language, right? But I think there's significant work to be done here in the sense that when we look at the history of Java, the history of JavaScript, and even the history of Rails, a big sort of work that all the organizations who were part of developing and stewarding those languages did was that they marketed a language in the same way as you would market a product, right? In the same way as an iPhone gets marketed, uh, we have to be very deliberate about marketing our languages precisely to people who wouldn't use a language, right? So to folks who would not uh, come to the conferences, folks who are not already attending these kinds of events. The second area, I think, is around consultation, right? So 
you know, one sort of challenge is it's very easy to go to people who are already using Erlang and say you should use Elixir, or folks who are using Elixir and say you should use Erlang. The challenge is in going to places where people are not already using these languages and helping them solve problems, right? So you think of this as sort of a you know, simple model in which you go to someone who has a set of problems and you say, what are the problems you have and how can I help you solve these? Uh, think of this as pro bono work in many cases where you just go out and you request to help people with things or where you go out into different communities and say, what kinds of problems are you trying to solve in your community, whether it's around big data or around streaming, how can I help you think about how you can solve this in a potentially different way? Now the last sort of axis around evangelism that I think is particularly important uh, is, is the idea of fanning out, right? I think there's a tendency in language communities, particularly in language communities that are already niche languages, to continue to sort of like spread out uh, to other conferences that are also uh, Erlang-based or Elixir-based. I know I'm guilty of this. I primarily attend Elixir conferences, and when I'm not at Elixir conferences, I'm at Erlang conferences, right? And I think there's work to be done around going to communities that are not Elixir-based, that are not Erlang-based, that are not functional, right? And going to them and talking to them about these ideas. Uh, for instance, one thing I do is I go to React conferences uh, that are somewhat functional, but uh, primarily based on JavaScript, and I'll give a talk that is primarily around JavaScript, but then halfway through the talk, I'll segue into a discussion about Elixir, uh, and folks will be confused for a few minutes, but then they'll realize, like, well, okay, this is fine, this is okay, this is happening. And I think that's kind of the work that's necessary, right? Uh, is we have to go into communities like the Java communities, we have to go to their conferences and begin to spread these ideas because uh, getting those folks who are not already adopted and are not already on board is the only way for us to actually increase the size of the community as opposed to the depth of the community. So by way of conclusions, um, I think that it's important to note that the history of functional programming uh, is not static, right? Uh, more importantly, it's always already political, right? So if you look at Sun Microsystems and Oracle, you know, they were very intentional about making the claim that Java may have not been uh, the best language or the most computer, you know, sort of the most, most scientific language, but they were invested heavily in making sure that it was going to become the most dominant language. So we can see then that functional programming uh, and programming more generally is already political, and we have to politicize it and be be pretty strongly you know, opinionated about how we promote languages that we think are important and we think ought to be the best. We are also responsible uh, for determining what the future of functional programming will be, right? I think it's especially important in the context of Erlang, right? it's sort of this long history, uh, but this sort of new generation of developers who are coming to Erlang from Elixir, uh, we are the folks who are responsible for determining what the future of functional programming will be, and uh, we have to be good stewards of the past. But by the same token, I think this quote from Franz Fanon is important, which is that uh, we, I do not have a duty to be this or to be that. I am not a prisoner of history. I think this is important to remember, which is that Erlang has this sort of rich history, but we are not bound to that history. We have an opportunity in the context of Elixir, but also in the context of everyone here, to invent a new history for Erlang, to invent what Erlang will be in the next 30 years, as opposed to uh, being beholden to what the past will be. So if we return to that story I began with, uh, I'd like to couch my hope for Elixir and by extension, of course, Erlang, uh, in the context of that story. My hope is that a decade from now, um, my answer to that boot camp student will be, you should learn Elixir because it'll get you a job, right? And even more so, I hope and I, I sort of pray that even uh, developers like my niece who are, who's currently 10 years old, that she will not even have to ask the question, why should I learn Erlang, why should I learn Elixir, precisely because it will be readily apparent both from teaching but also just from the job market that this is the way you should learn to program because it is a good program model and a model that will get you a job. And uh, with that in mind, thank you. That's a, that's, a, that's a really good point. I think, you know, kind of speaking on that, I think there's a sense in which it's very easy to, 
sort of demean other languages, especially PHP, for being not the most interesting academic languages. Um, but I think it's precisely that ability to take a language that's hard to approach, like C, and make it easier for folks to understand that allows a language like PHP to dominate most of web programming today. Right? So that dovetails, unless there are other questions. That's a really good point. I, th I, think, I think there's several sort of key areas where collaboration could happen. Um, I think one is around this, there's a basic concept, right, that distributed systems are, are becoming, one, in vogue, right, more popular, but also it's a problem that people in industry are always tackling, right? It's how do you solve problems around uh, consistency, availability? I think the Erlang community has solved these problems like time and time again. It's like a core part of OTP. And I think the sort of the Elixir community is always attempting to solve those problems and make them more approachable. But I think that's one place where, you know, the Erlang folks can come to the Elixir folks and say, hey, we understand OTP much better than you ever, ever will just because, like, Erlang does OTP better than anyone else. And I think the Elixir folks can say, well, we understand how to present OTP in a way that's simple for folks who are trying to solve problems. And I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Uh, Chris Keithley from Latote, for instance, is attempting to build uh, some, some useful ideas around uh, distributed systems, particularly uh, consistent systems. And I think that's one place where you can see that OTP can be so useful, uh, but understanding Erlang very deeply and collaborating with the Erlang community is a key part of how Elixir can actually move forward and, and help solve problems in that world. Yeah, great question. Uh, just to continue on with that, how do you, in what you've seen with Elixir and Erlang, uh, how do you break down the sense of gatekeeping where it's come up, especially early on when Elixir was first getting started, a lot of, well, not a lot, but there was a sentiment that why would I hire a Ruby person that came over to Elixir because Ruby's crap, or you know, whatever the perception was from an Erlang programmer, it was, it's like the bar is high to learn Erlang, and that's a good thing because it weeds out the crappy programmers. And that, that gatekeeping, how do you guys, or how do you particularly, and then the Elixir broad, more broadly, overcome that sort of gatekeeping of, we've got really good programmers learning Elixir, and they can contribute to Erlang and Beam. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. it's no longer, a, you know, learning Erlang doesn't have to be hard. And by extension, Elixir can make it easier to transition into Erlang. What have you been saying? Uh, so, I mean, so funny fact, so two years, for two years I worked as an Elixir developer professionally, right? And, and one of the challenges that I found uh, when attempting to onboard new engineers was uh, helping them understand that like the key parts of Erlang that you need to know are not the syntax, right? Uh, Erlang is not a syntax, which is, is sort of hard for people to come to terms with because that is not the most interesting part of Erlang. The most interesting parts are its concurrent programming model, uh, its approach to distributed systems, OTP as a sort of uh, protocol uh, or platform rather. And I think if we can sort of distinguish those things and say uh, making it hard for people to get into an ecosystem is actually detrimental because uh, what they're actually sort of, what we're doing is we're losing folks who would actually be great Erlang developers because they can't get over the sort of basic, you know, syntactic ideas or the basic sort of cruft of the language. So I think Elixir has a unique opportunity to introduce people to the best parts of Erlang, the parts of Erlang that I think Joe Armstrong, et cetera, would say are the actually important parts, right? Building uh, reliable, resilient systems, right? And I think if we can continue to do that as a community, uh, I think the Elixir community is already doing this, but I think the Erlang community is also invested in that effort as well. But we have to be very, very cognizant that uh, what makes Erlang special is not its syntax, but rather its, its programming model, right? And we can teach folks that without uh, you know, using tricks like syntax to ward them off. Thanks.